Joshua chapter 14. You know what? Why don't we stand and read the verses together? Cool? cool. Let's give reverence to the Word of God and also let's burn some calories. <laughs> Here we go. It says, And the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunan, the Kenazite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever. Because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said. These 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word of, um, to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now... <laughs> Here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Both for going out and for going, coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard in that day how the Anakim were there. And that their cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kirjath Erba. Erba, I'm sorry. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had, then the land had rest from war. God wants us to live a blessed life. He wants us to live in victory. In fact, He wants us to live, <laughs> to live on the mountain top of victory, and not to live in the valleys of depression, despair. But the only way for us to do that is that we have to believe the word of God. We need to be able to let go of what we think and hold on to His truths if we want to live victorious lives. So we're going to journey through the book of Joshua here for a moment. And for those who are taking notes, I'm just going to give you some, uh, lay a foundation so you can get a feel of what we're going to be talking about. So if you're taking notes, I want you to know this. I want you to know that the book of Joshua, yes, is a book of history, but it's, a, but it's also a, an illustration it's an illustration of the victory that the new believer in Christ ought to have. The Apostle Paul shared with us in, in his letter to the Romans, in Romans 15, 4, he said, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So whatever happened in the Old Testament, he's saying, it was written so that we can glean from their examples, so we can learn from their experiences. So what I want to do is I want to dive into this story and learn from their examples, from their experiences, so that we can live a life that's going to honor God and glorify the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I want you to know this quickly. I want you to know that Canaan meant a few things. Canaan represented the land of victory, but it also represented the land of rest to the New Testament believer in Christ. It represents victory, and it also represents rest. The land of Canaan, listen closely, sp speaks of being free or released. Released. If you remember with me that the nation of Israel was in bondage in Egypt for many years. They were, not, they were robbed of, of, of living in that freedom that, you know, and everything that comes along with it. They were under a, a wicked um, um, ruler, and, and, and they were forced to labor. So when they think of Canaan, it, it spoke of them being released from those horrors and going into a place of rest. As believers, we can find ourselves being in bondage to the flesh, to the world, or to Satan. And it will drain us of our joy and peace. It will drain us of all that God wants for us if we allow ourselves to remain there. Listen, you can find freedom in Christ. Amen? 
And my hope is that today you will find that if you haven't yet. Another thing that I want you to note is that Canaan meant rest, as I mentioned earlier. Up to this point, we know that the Israelites have been wandering in the hot desert. But now they're going to enter into a land where they're finally going to rest. Again, many believers today are not resting in the Lord. They are still nervous. They are still frustrated. They're still irritated. They're anxious and afraid and antsy. They're not experienced peace because they haven't found their rest in Christ. They believe in Christ, but they have a hard time believing his words. And because of it, they have robbed themselves of rest and joy. Canaan also represents another thing. It represents refreshment. You see, in the desert, and the Israelites were pretty much on a desert diet, if you know what I mean. But now they're going to enter into a land where there's going to be milk and honey. There's going to be grapes. There'll be wine. And I'm not talking about intoxicating wine, okay, guys? They're going to get into a place where they'll be able to refresh themselves. Oh, God wants you and I to be refreshed in Him. And He brings that refreshing through the Word of God. Another thing that I want you to know is that it, the, the land of Canaan speaks of reality. You see, up to this time, they have heard about this place. They heard sermons about Canaan, but they never saw it for themselves. You see, my desire is for all of you guys to experience victory and rest. And my prayer is that you will enter into the spiritual Canaan and that this hope that is presented to you may become a, rela a reality in your life. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? Amen. I know for years I, I, I was not experiencing these blessings because of my unbelief, because of my doubts. Because I would think that the word of God was not for me in particular, but for everyone else. It wasn't until I started receiving the word of God as him speaking to me. He made his promises to me. It's then when I received it that I was able to experience the promises of God. Another thing I want you to note is that Joshua represents Jesus here in this story. He was the one that led the people out of the land of Egypt and into the promised land where the, where the rest that where they will experience rest. Jesus represented by Joshua is the one that leads us to victory and to rest, isn't he? Joshua in the Old Testament simply means is the name of Jesus. Caleb represents you and it represents me. He represents the believer who's about to conquer the mountain as we read in verse 12. This mountain that we all can conquer in Christ. But Caleb, in order for him to experience those things, he had to possess what was promised to him. So we're going to look into the life of Caleb. And we're going to talk about the promises that we have in God very quickly. And how we can obtain it. What kind of person we have to be. And we're going to see that by looking at the character of Caleb. Okay? We're going to look at the character of Caleb. Now the first thing I want you to note is that he was a man who gave all that he was to God. That means that he was a man who was committed. He was a committed man. Notice what it says in verse 8. It says, but I, at the last part of the verse it says, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. Now notice verse 9. Again he says, it says, you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Verse 14, we read it again. Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. Three times you read that Caleb followed God wholeheartedly. You see, all that Caleb was, his fiber, his nerves, his hair, his entire being was all for God. He was devoted to the Lord. God was his everything. His trust was in the Lord. His strength was in the Lord. His life was the Lord's. You see, listen to me, guys. We have to be committed believers. We have to be fully committed to, the, to God. Let me ask you a question. Are you devoted to the Lord? How is your devotion to God? The reason why many people are not experiencing the, or possessing the promises of God is because they're not fully committed. They're following the Lord half-heartedly. And because of it, they're only robbing themselves. And you're missing out. Oh, you're missing out. God wants you to have victorious lives. You're probably saying, well, God doesn't expect all that of me. Because I'm just a simple man. You see, I'm a nobody, Dave. Well, listen to me. You're wrong. 
God deserves all of us. And the reason why is because he gave all of him so that we can be his. Amen. You know, when, the, when Jesus uh, died on the cross, his blood paid for our sins. He paid for us. In Acts 20, 28, we're told that he purchased the church with his own blood. When you understand the value that he placed on us, when you understand the extent that he went so that we can be of him, oh, it will fill your heart with gratitude. And in response will be that you will offer yourself to the Lord's service as a living sacrifice. That's why Paul was saying in Romans, was saying Romans 12, right? Present, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves as living sacrifices. And he goes on, he says, because it's your reasonable service. Going back to that family I talked to you guys about earlier, they ended up going, leaving the place, and the, 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 the young son, uh, he's a 15-year-old kid, name is Michael. He came back, man, and, and I'm talking to him, and, 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 you know, the guy's a little bit more shameless, you know what I'm saying? You know, and I tell him, hey, dude, I said, you ain't going to be here for free, buddy. You know, he goes, what are you talking about? I said, listen, you got to do, do, you know, pick up your weight around here, like, you know, leaving your jeans on the floor and maybe throwing out the trash and washing the dishes. You know, you're not paying a penny. And he said, okay. I said, let me tell you something. If we're blessing you, if God is blessing you through us, I said, you can at least take out the trash, man. At least. That's your reasonable service, man. I mean, everything else is free. And it's the same thing with God. If God purchased you and he demonstrated his love by going to the cross and, and then he blesses you with all the heavenly things from heaven, all, everything, <laughs> everything that is his is ours in Christ. The Bible says that everything is yes and amen in him, right? So, so if he's given everything so that you can obtain everything, shouldn't you give your all to him? We're talking about commitment. If we're talking about surrendering our every being to him, everything, our hands, our feet, our lips, our eyes, our ears, our hair, everything, your life is his. He purchased it with his blood. We are to commit all to him. Listen, if we haven't given him all, then the reality is that we have disgraced the, our Christian faith. You see, God let me put it this way. A half-hearted follower doesn't cut it for God. A half-hearted follower doesn't cut it for the Lord. One preacher said this, quote, The half-hearted will be the faint-hearted. And if you're the faint-hearted, you will never conquer that mountain. You will never conquer Canaan. Are you hearing me? We have to be in it to win it. We have to go all in or you'll be out. Are you committed D.L. Moody heard an evangelist once preach. Uh, 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 D.L. Moody heard an evangelist by the name of Henry Var Varley once say this. The world has yet to see what God can do in and through and with. With a man who is fully, fully committed to him. D.L. Moody responded by God's grace. I will be that man. Is that you today? Are you that one that will be fully committed to him? Because I'll tell you this. He was fully committed to you. You know, when I read John 3.16, yes, I read the demonstration of God's love. When I read John 3.16, I, 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 I see the passion of Christ. But I also see the faithfulness of Christ. I want you to think about it because him being on the cross, it began somewhere. Let's just take you back to Gethsemane. When he was there crying, Lord, Lord, if there's any other way. Let me know, right? He says, I'll do it, but not my will, but your will be done. And then from that point on, his, his, uh, uh, his betrayer comes with his soldiers and they grab them. And from that point on, they slap them, they take him in, he's, get, he's falsely uh, judged, and then he's, he's beaten, and then he's spit upon, and then his beard is yanked, and then he's, he's, you know, he's just uh, treated in the most horrible way. And why am I saying that? Because, listen... He, when he was going through that, you and I were in his mind. He knew you were going to reject him. He knew you were, you were going to rebel against him. He knew you were going to still do your own thing. And yet he still went through it for you and me. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about it. He was fully committed. Why are we fully committed? 
As I mentioned, half-hearted saints don't cut it for God. You think God is pleased because you come to church and you tip your hat at him? Oh, no. He wants your heart. He wants your all. He wants your being. Are you fully committed? Know that God will be satisfied with nothing less than a total commitment from you. He isn't impressed by the little things you do. He's impressed when you give him your all. If you're not committed, believer, the question is this, why aren't you? Why aren't you? Do you know that Jesus didn't come and die on the cross so that you can still serve the world, the flesh, and Satan? Can you imagine if this whole church was committed? The work that God would do through this church. Oh, man. May we be like Caleb, a man who was committed. But there's more. Notice it says, I want you to notice how he was confident. But not in himself. He was confident in the word of God. Notice again, we read in verse 6. He says, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses. Notice that. Now notice verse, uh, verse 10. Again, we read, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses. And then notice again in verse 12. He says, <laughs> and he drove them out, as the Lord said. He was confident in the word of God. Oh, man, I read that and I ask God. Help me to be confident in your word. You see, God gave Caleb that mountain <laughs> and he conquered it because he had confidence in the word of God. So with us, <laughs> we must have that heart of Caleb to be able to trust in the word of God, to be able to, to know that thus says the Lord means it's going to happen if it's his will. You know, when God says, don't worry, do we still worry? When God says, look, man, count it our joy. Do you count it our joy? Because it produces, per, you know, character, perseverance, and so forth. Do you believe it? Do you have that confidence? So, you want to conquer your, your demons, they say, or your heal. You have to be able to go in to whatever God has given you with his word, like Caleb and the title deed in his pocket. God gave it to him already. He just had to possess it. God promised to him and with confidence he went. Listen, you and I must walk in the confidence of God's truth. And those truths come from where? From his word. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes through hearing and hearing from the word of God. You see, what made Caleb this confident man was that he was a man that believed the words of the Lord. Church, do you believe in the word of God? If you do, you should be bathing in it day in and day out. You should read the word. You should know the word. You should keep the word. You should speak the word. It is in the word of God where you find the promises of God that will help us, that will heal us, and that will keep us in the will of God. It's all in this book. And yet it is the book that is most ignored in our homes. Let me ask you a question. How many times did you open this book before Sunday? Here comes the self-righteous. Well, I do that every day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I'll tell you this, the majority of us don't. And then when we read it, we speed read through the word of God. We don't meditate or ponder it or chew it up. Allow it to do what it needs to do, sinking deeply in our hearts that it will move us to do what it's commanded us to do. Notice I say command and not ask. God doesn't suggest, he commands. And then he expects for us to, to live it out. Are you that person? You see, the problem today is that people that know God don't want his word. They want everything else but his word. And because of it, they're not living in victory. You know, when they hear messages like today, and you guys have a great teacher in Zamora, but some of you guys, that word just comes, falls on you and it just falls right off you like water on a duck's, a duck's back. It just rolls right off. And then you wonder why you're not living that victorious life. Then you wonder why you're still connected or uh, enslaved to pornography or to drugs or to alcohol or to anger and to bitterness. Is that the word is not, is not, is not being taken in. We just hear it and say, praise the Lord, amen, God is good. Oh, man, you need to be able to, to, to receive it with, with the purpose of, of obeying it. And it's in the obeying of the word of God that we find 
the blessings. Not only do we see this, but so we see his commitment that led to his confidence. And then it leads. It leads to his courage. He was courage. He was bold. When you read Numbers in chapter 13, and we'll turn there later, and when, when, when we read it, you, you, you'll make the connection. But he says, let's go, let's not fear. God has given it to us. He went in there with a heart to win. He was bold. He was confident not only to go in to face these giants, but he, he was bold enough to stand up against the people in the crowd that were trying to discourage the peop other people from going to possess this land that God promised them. Where they were going to find the rest. And all that they need so they can have sweet fellowship, courage. Listen, we'll never, we'll never be bold until we spend time in the word. And we allow the word of God to sink, deep, down, sink deeply into our hearts. So where do we get this courage from? Where do we get this boldness from? You know where? With Christ. It's that simple. Remember John and, and Peter? Remember how they, after experiencing, you know, the Holy Spirit, after, you know, experiencing, you know, their walk with the Lord and the Lord descended. Remember in the early church what happened when they were brought before the Sanhedrin and they were threatened? And they would not back up. They did not shut up, man. They just kept on doing until they, God took them up, right? But what I love about this is how the world recognized their boldness. And this is what it says in Acts 4.13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were at orale mode. It says, why? Because they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. I'll tell you this, as you're hanging out with Jesus, you start loving him. Right? And, that, and then you start seeing the promises and everything that he gives to us in order for us to overcome. And then you enter in those trials with what? With that confidence, with that boldness to be faithful to his will. But the problem is, is that a lot of people ain't spending time with Christ. And the opposite of boldness is what? Cowardness. We become cowards. And we're not effective in the things of God. You know, in Revelation, one of the sins that the Bible talks about who will not enter the kingdom of God is... The coward. I'm not saying that because you're a coward, you're not going to heaven. But if you're a non-believer and you're a coward, you ain't going to heaven. But for the believer to act out in cowardness robs others from the blessings that God has in store for them. Think about the person who brought you to the Lord. It was bonus and confidence in the word of God. That God was going to work. That now you have the privilege to sit here and to worship God and experience the blessings. And then soon experience glory. Because someone had the courage. What about now? Maybe you're sitting here and you know people who are in sin right now. And God is telling you, they tell them something. And you're like, I can't, Lord, why? Because then I won't be a part of their clique. I won't be able to be part of that. They're gathering. And you know, but, but Lord, no one's perfect. What a cop out. God has called us to expose sin. Not to condemn. But to expose it. With the right heart. To see them repent. And then be restored. And then be used to the fullest capacity of, of their being. But the problem is. We have no boldness. Which is the result of not hanging out with Christ. Now, we see those three characteristics of Caleb. But I want you to notice another thing. Before he went and took that mountain, there was a opposition that he had to overcome. Do you think that Satan is going to make it easy for you? Uh, do, do you? I mean, come on. Remember Jesus when he started his ministry? When he said, okay, now it's on, right? He goes up to that mountain in Luke chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4. We see it. He went after him. He attacked him. And he tried to keep him from, 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 from his allegiance to his father. He tried to get him to eat. You know, come on, if you're the son of God, turn those stones into bread. Try to get him to not trust in his father. Come on, if you're the son of God, throw yourself on this hill and let, you know, let him send the angels, you know. And all this time he remained faithful as he continued in the word. 
That's how he defeated Satan. But the point that I'm saying is this. Listen, he's not going to make it easy for you. He's going after you. And he's very cunning. And don't think that you can beat him on yourself. Because if you think you can beat him on yourself, you're beaten already. This is something the Lord has to do for you. You just have to submit and let the Lord battle, fight your fight. And the way we fight is simply get behind God and say, Lord, you take him because I can. <laughs> but here's the thing. If he had no respect for the Lord, he has no respect for you. And he's going after you. He's not going to make it easy for you. He's going to throw all kinds of obstacles. He's going to throw all kinds of opposition towards your way. Why? Because he doesn't want you to experience the joy, the peace, and all that God promises is in his word. Sometimes we make it easier, easy for him, don't we? He'll just whisper, that's not true. Well, that's not true. Well maybe, uh, well, maybe this, and maybe that, or maybe this. And so it's just like, with his popcorn, check that fool out. That was easy. Next. Dude, you should make it hard for him. You should make it hard. And you know how you make it hard? Faithfulness. Faithfulness to the Lord. But... There was opposition that he had to overcome. And once he did, he will be able to experience. See, those things that God gives to us, there's obstacles that's going to keep us from them. You see, Caleb was one of the guys who had gone into the land to spy it out. Notice again what it says in verse 17. I mean, in verse 7, it says, I was 40 years old when Moses... The servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart, he says. He was one of the guys, along with Joshua, and some other spies that went in. Remember that? They went in there. They checked out the place. They brought back a report and said, man, there's some big dudes right there, man. He saw them. He saw exactly what everyone saw. Listen to what I'm going to say, God. This is important. He saw something that he had to overcome in order to live in that promised land where there will be victory and rest. Someone said, nothing great is ever done sitting on a rocking chair. In fact, when you worry too much, it's like sitting on a rocking chair, right? You just rock and go, don't go nowhere. Like, oh, 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 going nowhere. Listen, if you want to be victorious... You got to get up and fight. Caleb knew this. He knew he had to overcome. But he will in Christ, of no doubt, we will. And then we receive the, prom then we receive the promises. So what did Caleb have to overcome? Well, we just read in notice verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. So what did he have to what did he have overcome? Well, turn to numbers with me. And keep your finger there, because we'll be coming back. But in Numbers chapter 13, I love this, man. This is so cool. Verse 30. They have already gone into the land. They were there 40 days. They spied it out. I mean, they, 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 they took note of everything that was going on. They saw also the goodies that were there. And then in verse 30, we read this. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. At this time, notice what he says. Let us go up at once and take, pos take possession. For we are well, for we are, let me read it again. For we are well able, I love that, well able, to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it, notice, are men of great stature. There, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. In other words, they saw us as grasshoppers, and we looked like grasshoppers. So what did he have overcome? Well, there was what we call the grasshopper problem. It's a grasshopper problem. These are doubters. The doubters. 
I find it interesting because, you know, when you keep on reading, we see that the people respond to this negative, negative report. Here's Caleb saying, we can take it. Oh, the Lord will give it to us. And here comes a dynamic, well, I don't know, man, because those dudes were huge. There's no way we're going to be able to do it. We're like grasshoppers to them. Oh, man. Listen, I pray you're not one of those grasshoppers. Because I want you to understand, little did they realize that what they're doing is that they're keeping the people from obtaining the promises that God gave to them. See, sometimes in our complaint, we fail to realize that we affect others. When we sin, it always affects others. So when you start doubting which is faith worth his enemy, people around you start here. So when you start saying, oh, I don't know, man, because God. When you're in your marriage, well, I don't know, man, God can heal this marriage and your kids are listening. Don't be surprised when you guys are gone and then you're trying to reach them to the Lord and they tell you, why would we follow the God that couldn't even keep you guys together? Oh, be careful. Because the Bible says that if you make one of his little ones to stumble, it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the deepest part of the sea. And sometimes we can be a means of stumbling someone when we have that grasshopper problem. Are you a grasshopper? If you're a grasshopper, man... Not only are you robbing yourself, but you're keeping others also from what God wants in their lives. Are you hearing me? This is important. Today, many have the grasshoppers problem. Even right now, you're hearing me preach and you're thinking to yourself, this is not real. It's impossible to live that kind of life. We'll never have true peace. We'll never have joy. You are a doubter. You are the grasshopper. And therefore, you're miserable. Because you're allowing your doubt to rob you of blessings. We see another thing. Notice in verse, uh, uh, in verse, where are we? Back in Joshua, in chapter 14, in verse 12, notice what it says. Keep your finger in the other uh, thing there. In the other verse. <laughs> notice what it says, verse 12. You ready? Here we go. Joshua 14, 12. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you, for you heard in the day how the Anakim. The word Anakim in the Hebrew simply means long neck. So it's speaking about the ones that we just read in Numbers. Were there and the cities were great and fortified. Notice that. In Numbers chapter 13 verse 33 we also read. Now go back. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And we, so we are to them. He had overcome the giant problem. The giant problem. You see the Anakims were giants. And the problem with the other group was that they were looking at them rather than looking on God. And sometimes we have giants in our lives. And when we take our eyes off God and put them on the problem... We don't experience, like I said, what God wants from us. You know, when I look at Caleb, he's looking at it through the eyes of God, not like the people. Why do I mean by that? Because in chapter 14, just right there, right next to the in verse 9, I want you to notice his response. I love this. <laughs> Check this out. This is cool. He's speaking, right? At this time, people have complained. Moses and Aaron are on their face before God. <laughs> before the, uh, the, the assembly of the congregation. And then Joshua and Caleb ripped their clothes, and they're standing up, and now they begin to speak. And in verse 9, as we're continuing on that speech, he says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. No, San Chavalas is what he's saying. Look. <laughs> For they are, they, are, they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. I want you to notice this. Did you catch it? Did you see? He's excited. How do I know? Because he's looking at these giants like what? You guys find it there? No. Bread. He said they're like bread. He said we're going to eat those giants for breakfast. We're going to tear them up. We're going to have them for breakfast. In other words, check this out, guys. He's looking at them and saying this is going to be what's going to get us over that house. Why do I say that? Listen closely. Do you know what bread is? Bread is what we eat to strengthen us. 
and also enlarge us, if you know what I'm saying. They say that pan is the root word for panza. <laughs> but check this out. Listen, guys. He sees them as bread. Caleb is saying that the giants will be the means of their growth, not their defeat. Can I say this? Listen closely. The difficulties that God gives us are the means that he uses us to make us stronger. Difficulties are really opportunities for us to grow. Some of us, we look at a giant like David, and we're like, let's do it. Or some of us look at the giant like Saul, oh, I can't do it. And his response affected the whole armies of Israel. To the point where David said, who is this man who's blaspheming the name of the Most High? <clears throat> Think about it. So, so here's the thing. David took on the opportunity and it made him stronger. <laughs> you know that saying, what doesn't make you bitter makes you better. Listen, are you going through trials and tribulation? Don't nag, don't complain, rejoice. Rejoice It's making you better. Does it hurt? Oh, yeah, it hurt. It hurts a lot. No pain, no gain, though. For those who work out, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there will be a time of joy. You know, I tell my kids, you know, when I was younger, man, you know, we had this whole thing, the gang thing, you know, smile now, cry later, right? Oh, yeah. Smile now, cry later. That's the world's model. Let me tell you the Christian's model. Cry now, smile later. You know what I'm saying? Because when you come out of it, you come out of it, you come out of, out of it mature perfected and stronger don't shy away attack it and allow God to work in it you know when my wife when God began to expose sins that, we, that took place years ago and we had to deal with it and, and I still had to struggle with my anger and I still had to overcome I was fighting my own convictions and it was hard but I remember after a while God began to heal us and we went to Calvary Chapel Montebello to share our testimony. And for the first time, Sonia was going to share. And I was, I was literally wondering what she was going to share. And I remember standing next to her, looking at her. And while she stood up there, I gave her the platform first. And she began to talk. And she said, you know, you guys don't know this, but there was infidelity in our marriage. And she began to share. And I remember her tears. And I started crying. And I started saying, oh, God. At that moment, the Lord was ministering to me. But God worked in a very powerful way, man. Because afterwards, we ended up going to the room, and, and she's walking in front of me, and I'm walking behind her, and something like this went on. I said, Sonia, I, I, I got to tell you something. She said, what is it? She, I, I want to apologize for, for, for all that I've done. Oh, I, I forgave you, David. No, no, you don't get it, man. I, I, was, a, I was a kid, and I was stupid, and I... No, 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 don't, don't worry about it. I already forgave you. She goes, see, David, you need to understand something. She said, I was a very extreme person, and she was. The type of girl that she would tell me, I don't love you no more, so whatever type of thing. And she said, God had to put me through an extreme to break me. And she says, then I wouldn't change a thing. Dude, I fell in love again. I did. I was like, I got my golly woman. Thank you, Jesus. But I'll tell you this, she went through, and I, and I witnessed it. Her good conduct, her submission to the word of God, listen, convicted me. And ultimately, her, remember when the Bible says in Peter that through her good conduct, she made, her, her husband who was rebellious would be won over? That, that, that happened in our, in our marriage. She looked at this difficulty and saw it as an opportunity. And instead of complaining, she educated herself in what a godly woman is. How to forgive from the heart. The power of praying woman. She read those books. For years, she read and she read and she studied and she prayed. And now, God is using her tremendously. Amen. Listen to me, guys. Difficulties are opportunities for you to grow. And, and, and there's been things in my life, too. You know, I was just talking to a brother, and I asked if I can share a story. There was a, an incident that took place in, in our church. And it was hard for me because my brother-in-law has just gotten killed. I went to Israel, came back, and they, the, they were, the church was in a little mess. 
And one brother didn't do much bad other than he didn't stand up. And he apologized for it. But I remember he was in the room and I was looking at him and he looked at me. And there was tears in his eyes and there was tears in mine. And I looked at him and I said, hey, bro. I said, I forgive you, man. I said, but answer me a question. I said, did you learn from this? He said, I did, Pastor. I said, then it was worth it. I said, my pain is worth for your growth. Don't worry about it. Forgive it, man. Let's move forward. See, guys, uh, difficulties are opportunities for you to grow. Don't try to run. <laughs> Dude, allow God to do what he needs to do when those giants come in front of you. Oh, man. Get excited. Say, man, I'm going to eat that up. That's going to be for me. I'm going to get strong. You're going to get stronger. You hear me, guys? Caleb had that attitude, man. Those giants were opportunities. And another thing that I want you to know about Caleb, is the reason why he was so victorious is because he saw through the eyes of God. He saw through God's view. To get over the grasshopper problem or the giant problem, we have to look through God's point of view. See, the problem is, which is robbing us from God's promises in a victorious life and a life of rest, is that we're looking through man's point of view rather than God's point of view. We need to stop looking. We need to stop saying, look how big that problem is and start saying, look how big God is. Right? Let me ask you a question for those who has flown before. First, if you're like, to, especially around here, you know, when you get close to the mountains and you look up, have you ever come across a thought and say, man, that will be crazy if I try to climb it up. That's too much. And he said, ah, forget it, man. I'm going to try, you know, I'll just come right here. Enjoy him from back here. You get discouraged because you say, oh, even though sometimes inside of you, you're like, oh, maybe I could. But you say, oh, nah, it's too big. Right? But that mountain looks challenging at first. But for those who travel and fly, and you look down on the mountain, it doesn't look as big. In fact, you're saying, oh, man, I can skip right through it. <laughs> right? Well, check this out. When we look through God's point of view, everything looks small. And we can go right by it. See, as Christians, we're sitting in the heavens in Christ. We need to look through Christ. And the Bible says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Look at your difficulties. Look at your giants. Look at your grasshoppers through the eyes of God. And you'll be victorious. Amen? Amen. So opposition must be seen from God's point of view and not man's. To be victorious, we need to believe the word of God. I'm tired of seeing Christians defeated. Tired of seeing Christians being put in the bed. We are Christians and we are to be marching onward. Moving forward. Don't let the devil put you on that bed. But let God bring you to the mountaintop of victory. Amen. Amen. Now here's another thing. Right on time. I'm doing good. So he, now another thing he needs to overcome. Let's read it. Verse 10. You ready? And now, oh, wait a minute. Of Joshua. Joshua 14, 10. And now behold, Caleb says, the Lord has kept me alive. As he said, these 45 years, it's been 45 years. If you're taking notes, Numbers 13, 34 tells us that the people didn't believe. And they began to say, you know what, forget it. We want to go back to Egypt. We'll die in Egypt. And God got angry and says, you know what, you guys ain't going to see the promised land. You'll never rest. And they died out. But sad that Caleb and Joshua had to wait those 45 years. Because when you keep on reading in Numbers chapter 14, you're going to read what God says. You know what, for, for the, every day that you were in that land spying it out, it's going to be one year. So 40 years later, from 45 to 4, uh, 85, he finally goes in at the age of 85. <laughs> so, so it says, he says, I am this day 85 years, as, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day of, that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, for both going out and coming in. Now therefore, give me that mountain, he says. I love that, man. I love it, dude, because he's telling us right here, look, I'm 85 years old, and yet I still have this supernatural power to go in and conquer. This tells us that when God gives us a promise, he'll give us the power to obtain it. Amen. 
God will give you the power to obtain it. That power comes in the Holy Spirit. That's why we are to be spirit filled. Every day, wake up, Lord, fill me with your spirit and walk in faith. The Bible says that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And part of that lust of the flesh is doubt. Walk in the spirit, be empowered by the spirit, and you will obtain those blessings that God promised you. Are you hearing me, guys? Again, this tells us that when God gives us promises, it gives us the power to obtain it. Someone also said this. The God who preserves the possession for the man is a God who preserves the man for the possession. God will give us the ability to obtain our promises even if he has to turn an 85-year-old man to a teenager once again. That's the Lord. He preserves. He keeps us. But we must stay there in his will. Trusting, believing, hoping. And that hope becomes a reality. There was a time I, I really didn't think I was going to experience joy and peace in my life. I remember the last time where I finally, finally um, God delivered me from this anger. The pain, the shame, the guilt. It was in a time where I had an argument with my wife and, and you know, I, I, I ran out the house. You know, when you're married for a long time and you detach yourself from all your old friends... You got nowhere to go, you know. <laughs> and if you're a pastor, you can't go to the sheep because they're going to be like, what's going on? You're the pastor, you know. <laughs> you know, so you're like, where do I run, God? Oh, I saw this coming, man. You got me, dude. That's awesome. So I had nowhere to go. So where do I run to the front of my house? And I'm sitting there in front of the, uh, on the sidewalk, just sitting there like this. <laughs> and I start praying, God, deliver me. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I want to be able to speak with confidence and passion without hypocrisy. Lord, deliver me, please. And I prayed for hours. I said, Lord, do it soon because the kids are going to end up coming to school and they're going to see me standing here thinking I'm a nut. Lord, please be. To the point where I was so exhausted, I was like, oh, God, please, God, please, please, God. And then finally, right when I started seeing the kids, I can hear the Lord say, you're the problem. Take responsibility for your own actions. I said, okay, Lord. I got up on my feet, and I ran into to the house. Okay, I didn't run. I walked in there. <laughs> I was tired, man. I started sitting there for like a few hours. What, 13 hours? I was just sitting there praying. And I remember I walked in, and my wife was sitting up in her bed. Kind of creepy at first. When you walk in, she's like... <laughs> What are you doing, man? Like the exorcist when she was at the edge of her bed. Oh, I got, I hate the exorcist from a long time, little kid. Movie of my fe greatest fears. Anyway, so she's sitting there, and I walk up to her, and I told her, I I I'm sorry, I was wrong. She goes, I know. She said, we sure. Tony knows what I mean. But she said, we sure. That's what she called me. She goes, I forgive you, man. Let's just move forward. You know, God wants to bless us, wants to deliver us. And he, he's, he's given us everything that we need to obtain what we want. From that day forward, I can tell you this, I'm free. I am so free. I can honestly tell you right here, you can be free too. From bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, shame, fear. But you got to believe this book. You got to take it to heart. You got to conquer these obstacles in your life through the word of God. And then you will shine for his glory and you will experience blessings. Oh, guys, if we would just. Here's another thing I see as I close. Caleb made no excuses. He was 85 years old. No excuses. I still have it. How many of us make excuses because we're too old? You don't get it, Pastor. I'm 75. Well, he's 85. <coughs> well, I'm too young. I don't have the power. Well, really, David was a teenager when he defeated that giant. No excuses. Stop with the excuses. Start believing. Start doing it. And watch God work tremendously in your life. In you and through you. You know, when I think of someone of age... With great strength and power is my dad. 
you know, we just had a prayer meeting. We went up to the mountains to pray here. I brought my dad. So another brother said, hey, we should take your dad, man. You know, yeah, he's, he's a man of wisdom. And, I, and, I, and when we got there, I told him, you know why I have my dad here? I said, because he's an OG. He's an, an elder. He knows the word. He has wisdom. Oh, man, I shouldn't have said that because my dad was like, look at me. Let me talk to you. I go, oh, daddy. Go for it, Juan. But you know something, man? I'll tell you this. He puts to shame those people that are young and can't even show up for a prayer meeting at 7.30 in the morning. He's there working with his hands. Showing us youngsters no excuses. No excuses. There's another lady named Teresa who sits to my left when I get up and teach. She got really bad to the point where she can't come to church no more. But I used to love seeing her there, man. And afterwards, I would go and talk to her. She would wait for me right there until I go and talk to her afterwards. And even the ushers would come and say, she's waiting for you. I go, I'll be, I'll be right there, Teresa. Probably late 70s. She got really sick. She sits there with her you know, tubes and her oxygen tank. And I go up to her and I say, Ah, oh, Teresa, I love you. Pray for me, Pastor. Vámonos, pues. And then I tell her, you know why I love seeing you come in here? She goes, why, Pastor? I say, because God uses you as a conviction to those who make excuses why they don't come to church. Yeah. Whew. Keep coming, man. God is using you in a mighty way. No more excuses why you should be at church or serving God. Any excuse that you make is keeping you from getting to that mountain to live in victory. Caleb was <coughs> conquered, and he went into Hebron. Hebron means association, which speaks of fellowship and relationship. In that land, he was going to have sweet fellowship and rest, not only with God, but with the people of God. Listen, you want to get to that place of fellowship, sweet fellowship? Apply what you heard today and watch and enjoy. Enjoy.